Martin Yanecker and I began speaking at 9pm on a Monday evening. Time just flew by, and when we looked at the clock again, it was 1.39am. That's right, over five hours of non-stop conversation that never once faltered. So this really is a piece-at-a-time conversation. Turn off the visual if you want to and listen to the audio whilst you are driving around, working from home or walking to work. Or if you have the luxury of simply watching, then go ahead and simply watch. This podcast will be brought to you in three parts. I've known Martin for over 14 years, ever since our respective daughters started school. My eldest daughter and his youngest daughter were in the same class. Martin has had cancer for over 25 years, and at the age of 62, you wonder how on earth he is still here. Part of the answer to that lies in the first part of our conversation. The answer will surprise you. Attitudes towards climate change, the nature of being, a revolution in positive thought, lessons in gratitude, the goodness of humans, a question of meaning, transforming our world and transforming ourselves are but a few of the topics that we cover. And of course, we would like to think somehow we may have helped you along the way. Finally, on a technical note, the audio for the conversation cuts out towards the end of our meeting. The last half hour of our conversation was not captured, and so you may find the ending abrupt. My apologies for this. This has never happened before. Perhaps it will teach me a lesson in keeping the conversations shorter. Thank you for listening. As always, sign up to Patreon to support this channel. The link is in the description. By signing up, you are supporting both this channel and my music channel, The Music of Charles. Please like, share, subscribe and press the notifications bell so you know when new content is available. Well, everybody... Have a listen to this. Have a watch of this. I give you Martin Yenneke. That's great. It's, no, it's really nice. Those, those I mean, I, I thought what I put on should be some kind of encapsulation of joy in life. Yeah. And color is definitely belongs to life. And I thought, okay, I just put a lot of colors on and I try to make it fat. <laughs> well, I, I think you look really good. Do you know, one of the things that I like um, about when we dress, it should be somewhat a manifestation of what we really feel about ourselves. And I was told very recently that I wear too much black, but I don't feel very dark. I actually feel quite light. I feel quite um, yeah. open. Yeah, open but to for other people, black has a different meaning. That's right. So, yeah, so I, I had a couple of people say to me recently, you know, for a person who's joyous and gregarious and verbose, you should be wearing something bright. So anyway, I'm really glad that you came mm. where you came in. Yes, I had, I had actually, when I was younger, I didn't care at all what I had on. Mm. Mismatching colors. I said, if people get upset about that, that's their problem. <laughs> and then I realized... Even if I don't want that, I have some kind of an impact on people by dressing in a way it, when it doesn't fit. Mm. Some people, they are really sensitive to mismatching colors or whatever. They feel put off. Mm. So even if I don't want people to put any attention to it, they will. So these days I put more of an importance to not over the top, but sometimes for special occasions, I think. And these are trousers that I wear once I have a concert, a solo concert or something. Obviously, I can't do it in an orchestra, but um, for me, that is a very vibrant color. And once yeah, I feel good in that. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you you introduced this evening that shirt as being your what? What did you say? Your happy shirt? Feel good. Feel, feel good, good shirt. shirt. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Why? It's colorful. It's, um, I love the sea, so the palms obviously uh -huh. have a, a meaning for me, but it's, it's just all those different colors. It's the variety in life, so to speak. Mm. Mm. So let me just, uh, yeah. j I've, I think we've already begun. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I just thought the way you said, you know, uh, you know, the colors and you know, they, they, they affect people. But I, I, I think what I'm going to do is just share probably a little bit of what I think is important about us a little bit. 
Yeah, yeah. You, um, just, just. I mean, so, it's your, it's your well, baby anyway. No, no, so you, I, just, I just thought. So, even though I've known you for effectively fifteen years, more or less fifteen years. Yeah. Our children go to the same school. Yeah. Or have done. It was only in 2018, really, when our daughters were leaving the school that we, you actually had that one conversation with me. And we were in the, in the garage. And you were speaking about your mother. Already then? Yes. Oh, yeah. Then it wasn't until this three years later, two weeks ago, on the Monday, that you had reminded me just through the fact that we were just... I hadn't seen you for three yeah. years, effectively. Um, it was only then that you reminded me about the story of your mother. Mm. Um, and I don't want to say much more about that other than it inspires me and I need you to tell that story. I love to. Go ahead. Um, my mother has been very inspiring in my life. In my view, my mom had actually a pretty difficult life. My dad died in 85, so she is a widow now for 35 years. After the funeral of my dad, the next day my brother tried to kill himself and then was psychologically very ill, and my mom bore the brunt of that. So for 25 years, my brother was living with her till he be misbehaved in a way that he had to go to psychiatry. And then it was a vicious circle like that, in and out, and it was horrible for my mom. And for years I thought, my mom is just lucky. She has that natural personality that can cope with that kind of shit really well. And it was only, I think, two or three years ago that I discovered her diaries and understood that's not the whole story. She actually had to practice good thoughts a lot. And then I, I have a very good relation with my mom. When I can ask her anything, we can have really good talks. And I asked her, I said, Mom, how come with a pretty difficult life that you have not become bitter. And then she shared uh, one of her days when her life changed. It was a particularly difficult day. I think my brother had smashed windows in the first level of the house and my mother just didn't know how to survive the next day. And in her despair in the evening, she must have had some intuition, said, what do I do, what do I do? Oh, maybe I just think about all the good things in my life. And that's what she did. And she said after maybe a quarter of an hour, she felt her body was changing. She felt some kind of sizzling in her skin. And um, she started to feel really good, went to bed and slept really deep and woke up the next morning and said, wow, I do that again. And from that night and that morning onwards, every single night and every single morning, she would go through that routine thinking about all the good things in her life. And I think that is one of the most intelligent things you can do. That feeling of gratitude once you have the two really important parts of your day filled with that feeling of gratitude, the whole day will get shaped in a different way as if you would not do that. And if you do that for years, then your life changes. And seeing how well my mom copes with difficult circumstances, I mean, obviously, my brother being re losing my dad first and losing a healthy son um, to that psychological illness, then I got sick, then I immigrate, then my brother died in 2008, I think. And so she had a lot of difficulties to cope with. And to develop that strategy of feeling regularly grateful about the stuff that is good. And I think we as society, we do too much of the opposite. We focus on the bits, they're bad. 
they are unpleasant, they are painful. And it was when Saskia, our oldest daughter, you know her, um, when she had her quad class 12 project, one of the, uh, she went to Africa and worked there in an organization. And then she later did a thesis about the connection between wealth and happiness. And in that, she mentioned a book that became quite important to me. It's called Hardwiring Happiness. And in that book, the author claims that we are originally by evolution hardwired to store dangerous, unpleasant, negative stuff straight away and forever. We don't have to learn that. That's built in us. And unfortunately, by evolution, we were not forced back in the old days when we were still hunters and running around and in danger of being um, gobbled up by a bear or something. We were not hardwired to store good things as automatically and as long-lasting as negative stuff. And to then discover that we have to relearn to store positive stuff better in order to come out of that negative bias. Can I throw something in Absolutely. there? Absolutely. I've talked a lot now. <laughs> no, 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 no. You haven't talked very much at all. I really love that story in of the hunter-gatherer because there was a, there's a significant part that most people don't realize about the hunter-gatherer. Yes, he was in danger. Yes, he was always looking out, part of the eyes opening up when we became, you know, we moved from the primate kind of, what do they call it, hominid? Um, the, the actual hunter gathering, the actual gathering of food and sustenance was actually only a very small part of the day. They figure now because they found things that substantiate play. The hunter gatherer may, may have spent somewhere in the region of six hours within their societies, playing daily. <laughs> so I just think this, it's yeah. kind of like, so your mother, to me, during the day, she does her hunter gathering. Mm -hmm. But at night, she's bookended her day. Yes, she exactly that. She's bookended her day with, I would call it gratitude play. Yes. Because it's a very joyful joyful game. Yes. It changes your feeling straight away. Mm. I mean, I've mentioned this in other podcasts, but I'll, I'll mention it again. One of the things I do with my students, and they find it quite alien to begin with, is to get them to look at their lungs and say, wow, I can breathe. Mm. Because if you think about it, it's a relationship between plant life and human life, mm -hmm. exchanging carbon and oxygen. Yes. And what an extraordinary relationship to have. Yeah, I like particularly that we don't have to put conscious energy into that. Right. The lungs just do it. I mean, can you imagine for every lung, every breath we take, we would to think, oh, I have to take a breath, otherwise I won't survive this. Mm -hmm. So this wisdom is built in us. But that is that brings me back to my mom. What I realized through her is seeing the positive things in life and feeling gratitude is something, maybe some extraordinary lucky people, they have that by nature, like the breathing in and breathing out. They mm. just do it naturally. Mm. But I would think that's the minority and even somebody like my mum, who had to practice that really, really continuously over years, that was new to me. First, that you have to do it. And secondly, that you can learn it. You can, can learn a new pattern of thought. And that is something that helped me tremendously with... Um, having had cancer and when giving a very bad diagnosis, to realize very early on, it really matters what I think. So I understood very early on, I can't afford to be in a bad mood long term. My immune system will not catch the bad guys as well as if I'm in a good mood. 
So for me, it was just a rational decision to see, I can't afford that. And I have a very simple rule for myself. I do allow myself occasionally to be in a bad mood. A day in a bad mood is not ideal, but it's somehow okay-ish. Two days in a bad mood gets borderline and three days is too long. Then I have to get off my ass and do some homework in order to change my thinking patterns. And to realize that, I still remember the day when I realized the only real freedom that I've got is the choice of thought. That was such an amazing day. I Before that day, I thought, once I'm in the bad mood, it's dependent on the circumstances that I'm living in. Yeah. If my wife treats me well and the kids are nice and the weather is good and the last concert went well, then naturally I feel good. But if my wife doesn't treat me well or the kids are really naughty or naughty is not really, yeah, pisses piss me off for, through their actions or the weather is catastrophic or whatever it is out there that's not to my liking, then I'm the victim of those circumstances and the only way out is I change that stuff out there. I have to change my wife. I have to change my kids. I have to change... Well, the weather will be a bit difficult. But anyway, I have a handful to do in order to be content. I have to do all that work out there. And the really bad thing is it never, ever works. And the funny thing is, is that... In actual fact, what you've just described is the true nature of resilience. Because resilience is where the world falls down. Yeah. And you're still standing. Yes. Or rather, you can still get back up. And the thing is, is resilience, to have resilience is actually a lot less effortful than to change the world. Absolutely. It's, to change the world, it doesn't work, and it's a massive amount of Just wasted energy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you're putting your head all over here, I know you're expressing. Yes, I'm, and sometimes I'm getting excited and don't think don't about the moment. Mic, that's, so. right, that's right. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so, and there's an element of, and a lot of people, and I say a lot of people because I've heard them say it, that they don't value stoicism. And yet I see the great Roman uh, philosophers talk about Stoicism as if, as if it's, it's uh, inbuilt into this kind of Roman philosophy of standing within the, 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 the what do they say? The catastrophe of life and being able to see it for what it is, not what you perceive it to be. A perception of life you see only through a small lens, but seeing the whole of life as ah, okay, I can you see that? One. See that? That's my <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so being able to, to be aware, to be aware that life isn't actually against you. That is a belief, and that is a very healthy belief, mm. and that is something. Maybe I just throw that in. Um, the day that really changed my life was exactly that topic. I went to, because orthodox medicine in the beginning were not very helpful for me. They were very negative and I turned my back and um, luckily I learned a lot of useful stuff and luckily I made just in time peace with orthodox medicine because without those guys I wouldn't be here. Anyway, what helped me really was going to a retreat to Carl Simonton. He's one of those really early birds with neuro, neuro psychoimmunology. So the connection between what Mind you think and, and, what, can, and yeah. what the body, body does. And I still remember when he was looking through his papers and um, had a talk with me and said, Martin, if you don't like your belief system, choose a different one. And I got really angry. Because I said, look, I'm running around with my belief system for 30 odd years. How can you say, just choose a different one? That doesn't work like that. And then he was super smart and said, mm, you're a musician. What do you play? I said, I'm playing violin. I said, what do you do? 
You play a piece of music on your violin and something doesn't work. What do you do? I said, I probably use a different fingering and practice that. I said, that's exactly that. That's exactly that. And your brain can do it. Your brain is designed to learn. What do they so, call it? Elastoplasty or something like that? What do I call? don't know what the yeah, they, f um, medical think, expression is. Elas uh, elas oh, plasticity. Yeah, elas elastoplasticity. I think that's what it's called. The brain's okay. ability to expand. And, yeah. Anyway, he said, look, the brain doesn't distinguish if you learn a new belief or a new fingering on the violin. Mm. It will take the same time and the same effort. So if you, instead of practicing 20 minutes twice a day on the violin and you're fingering, you could do that with a new belief. And in the same time, you will master that new belief. And I still remember, I came out of that session and thought, whoa, that's doable. And that's doable in an overseeable time frame. Mm -hmm. It still excites me that life works that way. We, life is energy. Thoughts are energy. Feelings are energy. And you said before you admire and you think there's a good side about stoicism. Mm. I agree. But I would take it one step further and say you can actually choose, not, not just cope with what is, but you can choose your beliefs mm. around it and mm. your thoughts around it. And I want to make that very practical. Mm. Today I had an MRI scan. Right. I went to Wellington and um, my yeah, veins... And can I throw in something here? You, you've had um, ongoing uh, cancer of over 28 years? More than 25, roughly. Yeah. 25 to yeah. plus. Yes. And um, given the fact that 10 years was seen as the max, I'm doing really well. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> Having said that, there have been ongoing problems over the years. I had three really heavy chemos. I had some two other treatments. Recently, I had a relapse where the cancer had learned a new trick. So um, I had my fair share of difficulties. Let's put it that way. But what I really believe in is what happens is actually less important than what I think about what happens. And, yeah, in the bigger scheme of things, naturally I could think the poor me, the poor Martin has had so much chemo. One doctor called it pretty industrial doses of chemo. <laughs> I got truckloads of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I do believe I tolerated that stuff pretty well because I had a good attitude. I never, I decided after the initial diagnosis, which wasn't done very well, I decided I will never do chemo. And then I was super sick. The doctor told me at the time, I still remember that day too, he said, Martin, if you don't change your attitude towards chemo, you will die. Not in months and weeks if you're lucky. In, in your veins, there isn't blood, there is jelly. We can't heal you, but I'm pretty sure we can buy you time. That was a day when I had to change tack. I was, until that day, I thought I will never do chemo. It's not elegant, it's poison, it's bad, it destroys so much. I just saw the negative side of it. But then I thought, hmm, maybe I'm a bit stubborn here. Maybe I just see those guys as the enemies and there is no need for that. So I had to change my belief about orthodox medicine and about chemo. And then I remember once I changed to accept my first chemo, I made a very clear change in my mind. Not only would I somehow stoically tolerate it, I would invite it. I would not see it as a poison. I would see it as a medicine It will help me. It will give me lifetime that I can change with really beautiful things, which I did. Yeah? Our two kids were born, although we for a while tried to avoid my wife to get pregnant because we thought with my life expectancy, maybe not such a good idea. So my point is 
it's really important to choose healthy core beliefs. And one of the main beliefs, I, I was brought up Christian. And that as a teenager, I lost it and became an atheist. And through cancer, actually, in my 30s, um, I developed, again, a spiritual belief, not a religious. Not Christianity, but a, no, not, Christianity not, not a religious, no, yeah. Not a religion, but a, um, a spiritual belief. Well, and maybe a connectivity between something greater than you, or maybe a greater, exactly. a greater set of principles or values that were greater than you are, and maybe a connection with an outer. Yeah, and a connection to the meaning of life. Mm. I, before, uh, as an example of something which I knew I needed a positive shift of belief was yeah, being brought up by Christian in a very traditional way. Yeah, You do your life here, you do goods, you do bads, and then you come to the terminal and then it goes either hop or dop. Frightening stuff. Mm. Not very positive feeling stuff. And it didn't explain to me the really horrible things, the things I struggled with, if, or well, no, not if, when really tragic things happen to children. They die of hunger, they get mistreated, horrible things happen to them, they have a very unpleasant short life. In my old view of religion, I thought, if that's just one life, that's just not fair. So I don't want to live with a belief system that's unfair. So I was thinking and reading books, really interesting books. And then since then, I chose to believe in reincarnation. Right. That is for me a peaceful belief that leaves those horrible things there, but it doesn't reduce it there. If, if a child has a horrible short life and it's just one, then I don't have to rebel against saying that. Those guys up there made a mistake. Yeah? I can live with that and still believe in the meaning of life, in the fairness of life. And that is important to me, they have, to have a belief system that, believe, that feels good, that feels healthy, that feels fair. Same thing is with my cancer. My cancer is very clearly inherited. My dad has had it, and my grandmother from my mother's side has had it, and it's a rare cancer. Right. So, and normally you don't get it before the age of 60. Right. So I was super unlucky. You were, what, late 30s? Early? I was in my 30s. Late 30s, yeah. And <clears throat> they, for a year, they didn't think it could be that because yeah, you never get it at that age, so we don't look there. Right. Is, is it too much to say what it is? It's a, it's it's called Waldenstrom's disease. It's a non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Right, right. So it sits in the bone marrow and produces. Right. That is another thing that I changed my belief, my belief on. First, I you know you always are then told you're sick, and at some stage I decided no, I'm not. One cell out of millions has gone wrong. One. Okay, unfortunately, it multiplies a bit. But it's just one type. That doesn't make me an unhealthy person. No. And it even came to the point where in Germany I was allowed to get a, a pass for a um, handicapped person right. that would have given me more um, tax parking return, space parking things. space, a lot of practical advances, uh, advantages. And after I changed my thought pattern on that, I refused that. I said, I don't need it. Thank you. I don't renew it. I'm actually a healthy person with one cell that has gone wrong. Do you know that's so, so funny? I mean, I, it's it's such a wonderful way to think. You know, uh, gosh, you've made me think of several things, and I, I don't know which one to approach first. But here we go. Uh, it's a bit like you know. So I've got those little aches and pains that one gets as one starts to slow down. You're sitting at a piano for six hours a day, roughly. Yeah. And I had a mindset. This was quite recent. This is quite recent. And uh, it was, oh, God, I'm getting older. Okay, so that's strike one, right? Strike one is, ah, oh, I've now looked at age negatively. Yes. Okay, so that's strike one. <clears throat> ah, what's Then you have the cultural um, narrative, which is, ah, you're getting old. 
So now, right, okay, you're great. Right. So, so we've got these, these two strikes. Not only do you think, oh, it comes with age. Secondly, you've got the cultural narrative, which says age. So you're going, oh, me on the inside is old, and everybody on the outside says, you're old and it's no good. And the third thing is, is you can do nothing about it. Mm -hmm. Now, it's just a very simple thing. I've been doing yoga for about a year now, on and off, and my hips are a lot better and what have you. And then literally two weeks ago, I was on YouTube, and there was a guy who did a sumo squat, and he stayed in the sumo squat for about a minute. And I said, I remember that from karate. And I've got a new goal, because when up to about the age of 37, I could do the splits. Uh, but as I started to teach more, I became stiffer because I was in that position. Well, I decided, oh, well, I want to do the splits. So I'll do that sumo thing because that's what he said. And I, I knew I could do the splits before. And I knew it came from doing karate because I'd done three forms. And I, you know, I could kick my leg way above my head for years. I can do that still now <laughs> once I'm sitting. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I'm talking about a real... Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah. You know I know, but don't know, just the for the audience. Comment. You know, I know, I know. But I could really do it, but I haven't been able to do it for a little while. So anyway, I decided, well, the splits is my new thing. So I sat in the sumo squat, just this, just literally this, mm -hmm. like that, for a minute. Healed my hips. I don't have the pain anymore. And I realized just through the science of the body and what I teach in, in my studio, that what I've done is I've literally taken away what that chair was doing to me. All the muscles are not in motion. I thought I was old. No. But I think the main thing is you didn't accept the sentence, there's nothing you can do about Ooh. it. And but that is that's a very good point because that brings me on to the next point. You see, in changing your beliefs, some of them could be so for instance, anybody watching this would might say reincarnation is hokey pokey, right? Absolutely. Right, okay. Yeah. In the same way as you know, I came from Mormonism. Yeah. And I now believe that's hokey pokey. Okay, but here's the deal. There's a bunch of people who don't, and they lead very good lives. And I've found that there's such a thing as truth and useful truth. So, <laughs> But for me, belief is I never claim that my beliefs are truth. No, 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 that's but true. I, I but just, they are useful. Yes, that <laughs> is the thing. I think everybody should see what the beliefs are doing to them. Mm. That's the key. For, for example, another belief that I changed was um, I'm the victim of my DNA. Obviously, with me having a having gotten a cancer that was inherited from my dad and my grandmother, and it's a rare thing, um, didn't make me feel good. And that's always the part. If you don't feel good, you're mostly. Oh, I realized in my life. Mostly once I don't feel good, I'm thinking something that's not helpful. So I was angry having been that exposed to a DNA that I inherited, and it wasn't my fault. But here I was the victim of that. I was the victim. There's nothing I could do about it. And I was in some way even a bit envious about the guy who, get, who got lung cancer, was a smoker, had it only in one lung. He got one lung taken out didn't stop, stop smoking, and was fine. But I couldn't cut my DNA out. And it took me quite a while of thinking and meditating and pondering what would be a better belief about DNA. And I came up with a concept that I really like these days. For me, these days, DNA only determines what is the weakest link in a chain. Mm. So in your life, if there's too much stress, too much pull on a chain, the weakest link will break. And that it brings, again, an influence of myself into my life. How much pull I allow on the chain is up to me. Okay. And, and there's actually research done on that. 
um, Carl Simonton, the guy that I went on the course with, um, he said in his research, 12 to 18 months prior to cancer breaking out, they are clearly enhanced or elevated stress factors. And in my case, it's super obvious. Yeah, I don't go in the detail, but um, I find that absolutely true. Anyway, so changing the belief, I'm the victim of DNA to say, DNA just is the weakest link, and I have an influence how much pull is on the chain that puts me back in the driver's seat. And that is something that's really important, getting out of the victim position. And that needs sometimes quite a bit of tweaking of old beliefs. They haven't been helpful. I mean, let's face it, we all grow up with beliefs. Our parents have beliefs, they pass that on. Some of them are great, some are less great, some are actually harmful. We grow up with that, and then I think you can do two things. You have two choices. Either you blame for the rest of your life your parents. Mm. <clears throat> Not a very smart approach, because no. it makes you angry and you feel like the victim. I, I changed my belief to, towards parentship too. I believe now in reincarnation, so I think once you are flying up the air, you have died, and you're looking for a new training field. And I said, out there, those parents, I might learn what I want to learn exactly there. So once I've chosen my parents, it would be super stupid to, to blame them for anybody. I have chosen them, so I better make the best out of it. So... For me, core beliefs, why am I here, um, what is my spirit or religious belief, what is my relation to my parents, what is my relation to my body, or even just recently I was thinking about that quite a bit, about the question, is life meant to be easy? And I spent quite a bit of time with that question, and then I answered it for myself, no, it's not. That would be boring. And I, maybe I did a little mistake as a young person, I was under 20, and I put my hands out and said to those forces up there, I want an interesting life. <laughs> and I really got it. Not an easy life. But it wouldn't have been as interesting if it would have been just easy. So these days, in a way, I can't lose. If there are real difficulties in my life, that's a, definitely a challenge and an opportunity to learn. So now believing difficulties in life have their place, spiritually speaking. So once something pops up that isn't easy, that's okay. And once life is easy, that's okay too. Mm. So with that approach, I can't lose. Well, I think it's, it's very reminiscent to me of how I used to believe. And I, I kind of believe somewhat similarly, but maybe slightly more philosophically rather than religiously. Yeah, uh, I, religion for me is, doesn't cut it anymore. Yeah, so, but it, it was, it's simply this. If you took this idea of Satan and Jesus, this kind of idea, mm -hmm. we... I say we, it was quite a kind of collective belief that if Satan was taking an interest in you, it was obvious that you were going to do a special work. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. There's this idea of that negative, that Satan. Well, all the demons are on you. So mm -hmm. it's therefore you have something significant. So live to the significance. So I philosophize about that a little bit more because I think it's a little bit like the muscle. You know, it's absolutely it's up against the the uh, <clears throat> the resistance, and you have to move forward. And and it's funny because <clears throat> I've I've looked at people, and I've been one as well, who've lived without value, nothing nothing to move forward towards. And it appears that the challenge. Challenges that come, they come almost like a black cloud. But when you're moving towards something and you have a focus, the challenges that will still come, they're kind of like, excuse me, just get out of my way because that's where I want to go. 
I'm not stuck behind the wall of the challenge. And it was, I don't know if you've ever read that book, um, How Not to Give a Fuck About Anything. No. It's, I think that's... It's, Sounds it's, like a good title. Yeah, it's really, How Not to Give a Fuck About Anything. I, I don't know if that's... I think that's anyway, but he says a very, very simple phrase. And there's a chap in there, Michael, and he decides that there is nothing in his life for which he isn't responsible. Mm-hmm. Nothing. Nothing. That means even if someone does something to him, he doesn't allow them the power to change his world. Mm-hmm. He then takes on the responsibility of of action rather than the reaction to it. Yes. I believe to quite an extent in that too. I mean, if the quantum physicists say that, that um, that sentence, what you think and what you feel doesn't change only how you perceive life, it changes what it changes what happens. For me, that's such a big sentence. That means, in other words, what happens in your life has something to do with how you think and how you feel. And I think it would be false or dangerous to try to control your feeling the whole time. Feelings, uh, then I would be busy the whole day to change something. But once I'm not feeling, I think feelings are a great indicator, like a red lamp on the oil temperature in the car. So if something is not going well for you, if you feel bitter or angry, or um, for me it's quite good then once I'm aware I'm not doing well emotionally, then just check through what am I actually thinking right now? Or what you said once things happen in your life, unpleasant things, I, if they are spectacularly unpleasant or spectacularly pleasant, then I actually make an effort and think, what could I have contributed for that to happen through thinking and feeling, but mm. particularly thinking. And very often I find some things and, ah, yeah, okay, for a while you were thinking um, envious thoughts about that person that just lived what you actually wanted to live. Mm. And then you don't have to be astounded that bad things in that regard happened. Because the, <clears throat> I love the idea of um, living in the feeling for a moment. You know, the feelings are genuine. Yes. They are a reaction to a circumstance. or Absolutely. A, so, <clears throat> and they are genuine. Yes. But there's there's two things that one could choose to do. You can live in it, and I think you've basically alluded to this. You can live in that feeling always. Yes. And that could determine you. You yes. know, that could determine could. by a default mechanism. Yeah. Oh, the, that makes me angry. I am going to manifest the anger in an unhealthy way. And the way you word it is, is a really interesting one because my wife and I, we had an interesting way... We watched a movie together where we both suddenly understood, for example, that makes me angry, is taking my responsibility away and giving that somebody else. Mm. Somebody else made me angry. It was not me being angry. Mm. It was that person's fault to make me angry. Mm. So once we understood that, I think I've done that mistake once to say that again. <laughs> Victoria just elegantly said, Martin, I thought you had learned yeah. that I don't make you angry. But that's a very important point because I think the idea of learning, sometimes we, we get confused, I think, between what true learning is. See, learning doesn't mean that you don't make the error again. I think because good learning means we make new mistakes. Right, okay. So, so how about this? So I have negative behaviors we all do that manifest themselves from time to time yes what i've learned to do but not a hundred percent is to go rather like you said here's the feeling that i'm feeling as a result of the manifestation of something that is outside my control generally i.e the wall fell down outside of my control that the wall fell down oh my gosh life is a catastrophe now okay so what am i going to do There's nothing in my life I can do. That wall has fallen down. No, I could actually just say, well, actually, that's a phone call. Let's get a quote. Exactly. Okay. But what I need to do, live in the moment of going, 
okay, yes, the wall's fallen down. I don't like that. It makes me feel insecure. Yeah. It's the stepping away and saying, okay, I've felt, I have felt the feeling of insecurity because the walls come down. But I no longer have to feel that. Yes, and sometimes, <laughs> I mean, you're right. Sometimes those beliefs have been ingrained for a while. And that was, for, for me, before I met that Carl Simonton, mm. I thought that determines me <clears throat> for the rest of my life. Because if I have practiced that for 30 odd years, there's no way I can change it. I mean, wasn't it Henry Ford who said, I'm not sure if it was Henry Ford, but I think it was him who said, whether you say you can or whether you say you you're can't, right. you are right. Mm. And that's... Exactly right. But um, with beliefs, they had been ingrained for a while. The really liberating thought for me was with the violin fingering. I knew I can practice a new fingering and it works. Yeah. I had the practical experience. And that analogy, to, when he said, look for the brain, it doesn't matter. If that's a violin fingering on you belief, the brain will do it if you practice it. But that is the downside. Understanding is the consolation prize to understand I have an influence, it's me, nobody makes me angry. But to overwrite old unhelpful patterns with new, more healthy ones takes effort. And that is what, what I saw in my mom. And that was such a discovery for me that even my mom, who I thought was just gifted by nature, um, she had to learn big time. She had to practice it. She went to monasteries, which I didn't know about. She really... So uh, can tell, tell everybody how old your mother is. She's now 93. 93. And she, she is... She's still, by the way, in terms of yoga, she still can go with stretched knees with a full hand down on the floor without warming up. Uh, but my mom is... For me, she's a great role model that she lives uh, this life of practicing gratitude mm. in a way. She, I mean, she sticks out. She lives in an old people's home because her short-term memory is pretty much nearly gone. But because she more or less remembers good stuff, she sticks out as, as being a, a person who is emotionally still very alive. I think last year or the year before, I, I had a camera in my hand and took just every 10 seconds in a conversation with her, took a photo. And the expression in the face, it, like a young person, really, you know, said, really, Martin? Oh, you're kidding me. <laughs> and that kind of thing. It, it was really a life. Mm. And that comes from gratitude. And, and for me, it's, it, it was a new thing to realize First, I can learn it, even if I'm not maybe as gifted as personality-wise by nature. Maybe I'm not the most grateful person by nature, but I can practice it, and there is a need for practicing it. Mm. How that, that book, Hardwiring Happiness, I understood it. We are biased towards the negative. Mm. And that's an evolutionary thing. We, yes, We've had it is. to look out for the serpent that was going to kill us. Yes, but now <clears throat> we are sitting in an but environment but we where we feed are... it. We feed it today. And matter of fact, you know, media feeds it. We call it if... clickbait, don't we? You know, we give it something, a negative title, and we hope that somebody will click on that. Matter of fact, we don't have to hope. We know some bugger yes, will click on it. Because, because... by DNA, mm. by evolution, mm. it resonates with you. That's why if you, if you watch the news... I would guess it's probably above 80% negativity. Mm. And yeah. there was a time, I remember, that was actually reasonably early in my life, I refused to watch the news. Mm. And my friends got angry and said, you're irresponsible. I said, look, what does it actually change in practical terms in your life if you feed yourself every day for half an hour with crap, with negative collected crap? What does what value have you got that is better than my life right now? Said okay, they are informed once they vote. Said okay, one month before the election, I watch two, and then I get everything I need to know to vote responsibly. Right. But apart from that, 
yeah, um, we give some money to uh, some good cause. I said, I do that too. But I don't need to watch half an hour crap every day for, for doing it. Um, maybe we can compare how much you spend and how much I spend, but I don't think that's the driving force. But I think the main difference is by you watching all the time the negati about, about negativity about mankind, you have a far more negative view about what people are about. I believe, mm. yes, mm. we have some assholes on this planet, but I believe the far majority... Just into the light. The far majority... <laughs> <laughs> The far majority of people are reciprocal They're in nature. really good people. people. Yeah. I mean, if you look amongst you and your friends, yeah. I find there are a lot of good people, good-natured people, helpful people. I, I wonder, I wonder, uh, look, yep. I wonder, you know, because it's, I, I get excited about this. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I know, <laughs> so much so that you speak over here. <laughs> yes, I no, can't that's, talk that's, myself. That's right. You know, um... I do two things definitely almost every day, almost every day, not, not, not every day, but almost every day. And I, and I don't watch television. We don't have one. Yeah. Um, I don't really watch the news. I mean, I, I did, I did watch a little bit of the, I did about 15 minutes of the uh, Duke of Edinburgh's uh, Prince Philip's funeral. Um, and I got drawn into the commentary around Harry and yes. with, uh, that kind of stuff. And you know what my thought was? Leave the buggers alone. <laughs> I, just, I just thought to myself, because, you know, and, and this I'll come back to, you know, mm. a slightly more um, beneficial topic in a second, but if that had been my family and there'd been a feud in the family or there'd been somebody who said the wrong thing, well, no one would know. No one would care. And I thought about it. We make news. We make news. We want this news. We want this uh, intrigue. Yes. A lot of people want that. We it, want it the sells gossip. well. It, it sells, sells well. well. And we want people to have opinions. But I was told something years ago, 25 years ago. Uh, it was 1997 when I heard it. A guy by the name of Bo Short. And he said this. And it, it almost changed my world. I had to embed it in me for a long time for it to make any impact in my life. And it took me a lot. And matter of fact, it was in the last couple of years when I had to remind myself of this fact. He got up in front of a business group. He was a, a multimillionaire. And he says, you know what? You know what you need um, for an opinion, don't you? And the place was silent. He went, a thought and a mouth. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and when I when I <laughs> when I when I heard that, it was wonderful news because I know people have value, but I also know there's an awful lot of things that people say that don't have value, or if they do have value, it's a very insignificant value. And so I've tended. To, it's been a hard struggle because I say a lot of stuff that doesn't have value. <laughs> At least it, I want the words that I say to build life. And I, I, if, if it doesn't build life, why am I saying it? Yeah. So I do two things every day that are my job and stuff to do with my children. And these are the two things. One I pretty much have to do. Not really. They can do this for themselves, but I choose to do it. And the and the other one I have to do, but once again, I have chosen this line of career. So I'm a singing teacher. Four days a week, four and a half days a week, I get the opportunity to incrementally change someone's life. Yes, you can. Some of it, some of it, in fact, most of it, isn't mechanical. Mm, wonderful. Most of it is... Are you aware of how free that is? Mm. Affirming feelings of freedom. Mm. And the other one I do, which is it, most, most people do, I cook for my kids. Mm. Service. Mm. Okay. Nothing big. There's plenty of people who do it. Yeah. 
huge value. I'm not looking at the negativity that's outside. I'm thinking there's a, there is a, there is a, I'm honestly, I would encourage everybody to cook for their children at least once in their life because embedded in that craft of cooking for your children is love, concern, compassion, joy, taste, mm. the opportunity to sit around a table yeah. and chat about whatever you like. Those two things, just those two things, insignificant in many ways, but incredibly significant. Yeah, I mean, the, they, the significance, that is a very personal thing anyway. But it what builds. Is, if I would ask you one question. Come and ask me a question. Charles, what is success for you in life? Well, I have it defined. Um, it isn't financial. Um, but of course, like anybody living in this society, I, I do require funds. But success for me is helping as many people as I can as quickly as I can with as much good as I can do. Mm. So that may well be what I do in there. It may well be that somebody out there will hear this and go, oh God, I really like Martin's thoughts. Right? Mm. Yeah. Or it may well be the fact that I went, hello, mate. I have learned long time ago that if I monetize success, you know, I, yeah. I put I put a, a monetary value on success, or I put I put a um, a happiness quota on success, or I put a, a contentment quota on success. You know, for instance, um, I, I I can't accept what I have. Yeah. Or. I'm not happy, happy, not happy. I'm not happy. Therefore, I haven't met the bar of success. Yes. Then I will be forever, forever in search. Mm. Whereas I find it quite easy now to have success, there, because I, I haven't quantified the bar by by a default mechanism within our society which says unless you have the money you're not happy unless you have the things you're not happy unless you're not uh, unless you've got uh, um, unless you've got the woman you're not happy i have to deal with that one but anyway, <laughs> but you know don't get me wrong i struggle with the success thing it is an interesting question and i in my life i have I mean, life is changing all the time. It is. And so what may in one part of your life be a success is not in another one. Mm. And um, I think where I'm, I'm at, I mean, obviously I got reminded about my mortality regularly in my life, which puts up the question, where are your priorities? And if you had only that much to live, what would you like to happen in that time? And I have a bit of a habit these days to put out big goals that I want to achieve. So the biggest goal by far was I wanted to be alive once both kids have left school. To be able to accompany them on their part through life till they are yeah, young adults and leave school. And I wanted to be around that long. And for me, it's a massive, it's probably my biggest success in life that I was able to achieve something that a lot of people said, now, Martin, you won't, you won't get there. Yeah? So for me, that is something very special. Then a monetary aspect. Um, I wanted, and that's probably because of my awareness of mortality, I wanted to leave a house that is mortgage-free. So in case I have to go earlier than I want to, it would be good to be. So that has been achieved in February this year. Oh, well, congratulations. So that got a tick. <laughs> and then I need to find new goals. Otherwise, if there's no need for me to hang around, then <laughs> there's less motivation. Mm. And it's very important to to have a reason why you still want to hang on to. Yeah, what do you want 
to achieve where is the success right now in your life. And yeah, I can see it's it's interesting now with our children having left school, or with you, some of them, and with us, both of them, what they want to do in their life. I mean, for some young adults, they left school. It's very clear for a long time. They will do this, and that's important for them, and they will do it, and they will succeed at it. And for some other people, they don't have, don't have a clue. And my way of talking about it once I see that insecurity is because I believe in energy, I believe it's important to do something. The universe wants to react on what you want. If you don't know what you want, that's fair enough. But just do something. And then either you resonate with that or you don't. And then the universe knows, ah, uh, Martin, that's actually not really his thing. You don't have to encourage that. Yeah, But they need some kind of thing to react on. I have a lot of fun imagining a panel of creators they want me to help in my life. And they have a discussion sometimes up there. And I believe once I said, I want an interesting life, those guys heard me. And I have fun imagining that they said, have you heard that, what Martin said? I have an idea. <laughs> How about we make his life really interesting? Yeah? Not superficially interesting. We make it really interesting. And that has happened to me. I be really believe that, I mean, it's like with music. Music can be happy, can be funny, can make you want to dance. And it can be deep, soul-searching German stuff. Yeah, <laughs> Brahms, Bruckner, yeah, that kind of thing. Or it can be even melancholic. So there are lots of different ways of experience human nature in feelings. And since I believe the bad bits, the so-called bad bits in life, they have their place. Because learning, I will correct myself once I put that out straight away. <clears throat> I think pain definitely makes you learn. Without, with pain, you're forced to learn. But pain is the most real thing in our lives. But I have done, and I want those guys to hear it right now. <laughs> I have done a lot of learning that way. And these days, I actually would like to learn out of curiosity, out of joy, out of just do nonsense and have a, out of the love of new experiences in life. Yeah, to not just learn out of, out of pain. That is certainly one way of doing it. But uh, there are other ways too. And I like... I like my, I love my life, mm. but I, now and then I could imagine a little less pain would be actually not bad and a little bit smoother occasionally it would be a nice thing too. Mm. Anyway, the, for me, it's important to see meaning in everything that happens in my life. Mm. And that includes the difficult bits. But I think... Unless there is meaning in the difficult bits, you don't really live them. You don't really live. If, if pain is accepted only as something to get through and there's no meaning associated with it, yes, then you are purely subject to the pain. Then it's just suffering. There's actually a really interesting sentence I've heard from Ian Gawler. That's another mm. guy who had a really, Gawler. really... Ian Gawler. Yeah. Oh, the Gawler Institute. Yes. Yes, well, Wilhelmina went there. And oh, yeah. So I was there several times too. Right. And one sentence is still in my mind, and that popped in my head today when I was doing the MRI. Pain is an unpleasant feeling that doesn't have to hurt. That was his <laughs> philosophy about it. So he was of the opinion the thing that makes pain unbearable are the thoughts around it. Mm. And I had that today. I mean, they... 
I have bad veins these days because I had so much chemo. And I warned the guys and said, I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm probably a bit of a challenge for you. So they poked me here and they poked me there. And the, then they had to bring another person in because I was too difficult. And then I shared that with them and said, look, um, once I know the pain is short term and I know the reason for it, and I think that's a really important bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not just physical pain. Once you have a meaning for that pain, and dentist visits are a real good indicator for me where I'm at. Right. These days, I normally don't get an injection. Even if they drill, I refuse it, unless I had, I think, five years ago, there was a dentist who was not willing to not um, give me the num numbing stuff. And then I negotiated with him, then he agreed to just use half of it, at least. Yeah. Anyway, for me, dentist is a very interesting experience because you're in the, one of the most helpful positions you can be in. You're like a beetle on your back. You can't talk. And you know it will be painful. And what I normally do is I first arrange with a dentist and said, I know I can't talk, just in case I want you to stop. What do I do? Right. I can't talk. Is that okay if I raise my hands? Then I know I'm in control. And hit him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's once he's in your mouth. I don't think that's a yeah, smart no, move. That's fine. Anyway, and then I realize that sentence is true. I get then into a kind of um, mental conversation with my nerve. And then it really hurts. And I tell my nerve, I know what you want to tell me. There's something not all right. Yeah. And I, I know why it's hurting. There's somebody drilling very close to you. So thanks for the message. I got it. Mm. But now you don't have to overdo it. We will go out of this room healed yeah. in half an hour. So it's a short-term pain and please yeah i got the message don't shout it i heard you and then it works really well and for me that's some kind of analogy for life what do you think about the situation you're in so to go through if you go long term through some kind of mental hygiene process it changes your life and that's what my mom did yeah Twice a day, being great. And what, what I found interesting too, she does it to the point till she feels a physical difference. But that's, <clears throat> pardon me, every time I have a beer, I always have to clip my throat. But anyway, that's one of the most incredible things to me. That, and she wasn't taught, she didn't read a no, book. No. It was just intuition. But yes, the um, Qigong. Qigong teaches about the manifestation of negative and positive energies into the body. Yeah. We already know through simple scientific evidence that as we sing, mm -hmm. as we laugh, as yeah. we have sex, yeah. as we dance, yeah. all of those things release incredible chemicals into our bodies. Yes. So emotions that are associated with what we think is what we think it's actually the manifestation of everything that is united in our in the manifestation of happiness. So, for instance, if I was happy, I'm just not happy here. I'm also happy here. Mm. I'm happy here. Mm. I'm happy in my stomach. I, I mean, one of the most easiest ways to understand this is the butterflies. Mm. Yeah. You fall in love or you feel fear. You have anxiety. Where does it get you? The tummy. Mm. We should be understanding this more and more that when we feel some negativity and we feel cramped yes. across the shoulders. Do you know, I had a nervous breakdown at the age of 23. Um, I, I, I can tell everybody this now because it's a while ago. <laughs> it's yeah. a while ago. <laughs> I was excommunicated from the church years ago. Oh. 23, 24 years. And. Um, I just got engaged to my then girlfriend. Uh, wasn't Wilhelmina. Was um, and I, through through this great stress I was going through, 
in February, in February 1994, I can remember the day, I went to work and across my shoulders, I could no longer move. I was stiff. And I went up to a guy, his name was Dennis. I said, Dennis, I'm going to have to go home. I can't move. My whole body, he says, yeah, I can't move. And literally I was there like this. I couldn't do it. I went back to my girlfriend's place. And I was supposed to be drilling a hole in the ceiling to put up a net above her daughter's bed. And I thought I'd be able to manage it. I thought this was just a temporary thing. So I went up the top. And suddenly, all the way through my body, I couldn't move. The drill was stiff in my hand. I couldn't unclasp it. I had to get down off the ladder like this. That was the first time I'd really learned that everything that I was feeling manifested completely in my body. And yet, there was actually nothing wrong with me. Nothing. Physically, there was nothing wrong with me. It was all fear, all anxiety. Mm. And a lot of it was to do was what was God thinking of me? What were mm -hmm. the elders thinking of yeah, me? Yeah. All of this. And yes. I, I couldn't express it because I, th I thought, my God, this is my punishment. Mm -hmm. This yeah, is yeah. what I deserve. And you know what? They gave me beta blockers for a heart arrhythmia. And I had some pink, thick cream. Um, I don't know what it's called. Like a medicine. Pick, pick, yeah. To line my stomach because I had the beginnings of an ulcer. I mean, it is. If you go to a doctor, I have to admit, with those symptoms, it's difficult what to do with you. Yeah, no, that's right. Advice. I mean, I actually always like once a doctor says, Sorry, I haven't got a clue. <laughs> yeah. um, because sometimes they don't. No, and we, I well, had not... actually, with doctors, I want to write a book anyway about my experiences with cancer. And one big chapter will be uh, the connection between patients and doctors and the language that should be used. And should not be used. And I have had wonderful doctors in my life, and I had absolutely horrific doctors. The worst one I had is, oh, it's now 10 years ago, additionally to the non Hill Hodgkin lymphoma don't, I got. Don't, don't name and shame. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't no. say anybody's name. <laughs> no, I know. But I just want to say how destructive doctors can be. Mm. I came with a, with a second cancer that I had. Um, it was a prostate cancer. And I said, look, um, um, what do we do now with that? And I said, we don't do anything because you don't live that long. And then I said, look, I've heard that before. That was probably I lived 15 years instead of 10 then. I said, I have heard that before. You have only 10 years now after 15 years. Um, obviously, those guys got it wrong. So just in case you got it wrong, but I don't get it. I don't get it wrong. I'm Right. Right. So he insisted that I had five years left. That was 10 years ago. And um, I'm so proud of the last sentence that I said. Still super proud of it. said, look, luckily my cells don't react on what you believe in. They react on what I believe in. Mm. That was the last sentence that I said before I left. I hope you write to him. <laughs> no, he's not working here in the area anymore. I followed it up. All right. Yes, I, I wanted. I actually thought about complaining, mm. and then I realized, Martin, that's just more negative energy about yeah. it. If he would have stayed, I probably would have done it. But um, anyway, that was a bad doctor. But then I had really good doctors. I had, for example, um, a lady in Wellington um, that saw me for five years in a row and each year she would say once I was flying to Germany to visit my mom I said Martin with your CD4 count and a few other things in your blood you are really in danger you are like a heavily HIV and like a HIV person that's really with a hor horrible immune system mm -hmm. you shouldn't hop on a plane and you should definitely not go on s through Samoa on the way and anyway Each year, the first year she persuaded me to take some pills. I felt absolutely horrible with those pills. I dumped them and came back and said, look, with the pills, it didn't work. 
The next year, I had to sniff in some gas. And then I read in the instruction, I had to then dump the bottle of gas afterwards in a rubbish thing because nobody wanted to enter the room. So it wasn't that harmless either. And from the third year onwards, the next three, four years, I said, I'm not doing it. And then she said, okay, I respect that, but I have to make sure that you know the consequences. And I had to sign it. And I think in the seventh year, I said, now we will have our yearly talk. You will tell me I should take that. I will say, I don't take it. Then you will say, you have to think about the consequences and I have to have it in writing. And then she said, no, Martin, I changed my mind. I can see, despite that you have a low CD4 count, with you, it works differently. I changed my mind. Right. That was for me such a great attitude. Mm. That somebody, I mean, she heard her training and she knew what a low CD4 count means, but she could learn that for my body, it's something else than for the average Joe Bloke. I had really wonderful doctors. I had, with some of them, I had to put now and then my foot down. So I, maybe that's important to me to put out here too. You have to think <coughs> as a patient about the role of the doctor too. The doctors have sometimes a very difficult role, particularly, yeah, people who deal with cancer. It's, uh, they have, see a lot of, difficult lives, they see some people, they don't survive it. They have a difficult job. So you have to think about their role as well. But on the other hand, if the system works against you, and I have had one spe uh, spectacular event where after the chemo, a bubble popped up here in my arm and um, they didn't want to take it out because they said you have had... Um, just cancer treatment anyway, so it, it will be nothing bad. I said, look, if that thing grows, they want to have to take it out. And they, so they took it out, which I initially didn't want to, and then they examined it, and examined it, and it was cancer. It was a non-Hodgkin lymphoma as well. Right. And they thought it's the same stuff that I had in my bone marrow privately anyway. I said, look, guys, it behaves completely differently it maybe it is different and maybe it's more aggressive and I want radiation for that thing. They didn't want to give it to me. And that is the reason, in that moment I thought, what do I do? Am I the nice p patient who just gives in and said, okay, they will have their reason? No. I did some inquiries. I had a phone call with a friend of mine who's an oncologist and said, can you exclude that that thing is something different? said it's unlikely, but he can't exclude it. And the next meeting with a radiologist, I was in fine form. And I went right with a, with a finger. If that is her nose, I went right an inch there and said, if you don't give me the treatment that I think I need, you force me to fly to Germany. It costs me a truckload of money and a truckload of energy, and it's your fault. So I got radiotherapy, I went to Christchurch and they wanted to send me home after, after one treatment. And then I said, look, as far as I'm informed, I need 20 treatments to eradicate that thing. And then she said, that's for you, that's palliative only anyway. What? And I got angry. I really stood up by myself and said, if you don't give me the next 19 treatments, I can tell you right here and now what will happen. I will scream. I will not go away. I will be here at 2 o'clock at night and I will scream. And if I were you, I would believe it. I will do it. It's my life. So they gave me the whole treatment. And after the 18th treatment, they said they want to do a bone, mar a bone marrow biopsy. And at home, I thought, what the heck? Why do they want to do that right now? That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So I said, I want to have a conversation with somebody explaining why you guys think I need that right now. It came out that somebody had a look at that under the microscope a little bit closer and found out it is a, a new cancer, a far more aggressive cancer than previously. So they, they got really, really 
um, a bit afraid because it was clear they made a mistake and we lost precious time. And then they wanted to give me, just to be on the safe side, because they made the mistake. Heavy chemo when afterwards. When was this, by the way? Huh? When was this? That was in... in, in it was a collaboration between Nelson at the time and Christchurch. And when? What year? I don't remember the year. But anyway, the, the great thing is... I'm just, uh, I'm just marveling because you're still alive. Yes. <laughs> and the, the great thing is, why I, why I point that out here is you have to find a balance to feel and think with the doctors they're doing their best. And sometimes their best isn't very good. But um, they are trying. And I mean, I make mistakes too. What I want to see is once mistakes had been made, that we learn out of that. Mm. And that conversation, once it came out, they had had a look at that thing and found out it is more aggressive. The thing that I didn't like is nobody told me. Right, yes. I had to step in and said, why do you want to do it right now? And then the radiologist was great. She said, Martin, I, I got really white in my face once I saw the result of that. Thank you for being such a difficult patient for a while. <laughs> yeah. We thank you for that. You were right. We were wrong. Sorry about that. She was great. Mm. Another person was not so great. And then the, my oncologist in Nelson, he was great too. Afterwards, I said, look, that was a super difficult time for me. I perceived you guys, all of you guys, on the other side of the fence. And nobody helped me on this side of the fence. I had to get unpleasant. I questioned myself too. Am I right doing the right thing? What I want to do from now on is I get all the information, not just a part information, every little shitty detail mm. I want to get. And that I want that we talk it through together. And from then on, we had a marvelous co collaboration, that guy and me. And I told him too, I said, I believe you're a really good doctor, but you got it this time wrong. And your other colleagues, even worse than you, yeah? <laughs> you left more, more, opinion, more possibilities <laughs> open. Mm. But this didn't go well for me. And I like you as a doctor. I want to stay with you, but I want that we learn something together out of it. Anyway, the reason why I say that is there has been research done. The more difficult patients live longer as research. So the, the guys who always said, the doctor wants that, I do that. That is dangerous. You have to stand up for yourself. But you need to learn a skill. You need to really assess the situation where is it worth the fight mm. and once you have had the fight to cool down fast if you're just seen as the unpleasant guy that always is aggressive it's not going to help they need to perceive you as a guy who's actually quite reasonable but can get on his behind legs if need be and then he can get fierce and defend himself, and then he can cool down again. That's a skill that takes a while to learn. And I think it's a skill actually for life too. Mm. I actually learned another thing through a course. Uh, what was that called? Anyway, it doesn't matter. The, 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 it was about critic. My wife and I, we had for a while problems to criticize without the other gang in the red zone and getting out of control. Right, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and then I learned through a course, if you say something critical, before you open your mouth, you should check in what do you want to achieve with your criticism. If you just want to vent anger and aggression and or frustration, your own anxiety. just want yeah, to get yeah. rid of that yeah. by criticizing somebody, shut your mouth, keep it shut, don't say anything. If you're very clear about opening your mouth to make the situation better for everybody involved, for everybody involved, then you have not only the possibility you, um, to criticize, you have the duty to do it.
And I think that is with that doctor in Nelson, which I realized he's a good doctor. He made a mistake, but we both can learn something out of it. Mm. And I have since kept that. Once mistake happens, they, they do happen. Yeah. And we are, we are humans. We make mm. mistakes. Mm. And in, unfortunately, in hospital, it can be very, very costly. Yeah. And as the patient, you, I learned that you have to be really part of it. You have to count the pills. You have to watch the procedure if something has changed. If you get a pill you shouldn't get, or yeah, or you should, should take part of that responsibility. Well, well, and I, that has I, changed too. Just one sentence yeah, more. Go on, yeah. um, one of the first doctors that treated me with cancer, he said. And then we do this, and then we do that, and then we do this. And then I decide, I said, no, you don't decide. Do you know how that feels if you say I decide? Then I'm clearly in the victim role. I don't play that role. Mm -hmm. From now on, if that's okay, I would prefer if you say we decide. Is that okay? And that was during a time when it was unusual that a patient would stand up and say, that's my life. You don't decide about my life. Mm. And yeah, I think it's it's really, I mean, in a way, patient-doctor communication is, is just the same as it should be in, in partnerships. Exactly. Mm. That you feel for that person too, but you have to stand up for yourself. And sometimes you have to show your anger. There's a clear difference between showing your anger and being, and being anger. your yes, anger. That's right. Once you are your anger, you <clears throat> can be dangerous. <clears throat> you can smash stuff. And well, I've got to admit, I'm sitting here and I'm looking at your lovely blue eyes and grey hair, and it's and how fierce you can be. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 I'm, all of what you said is 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 bang on, and I, I was thinking just. As you were talking there, I was thinking to, I mean, I'll mention his name because he's a beautiful doctor, William Crawford. Ah, oh, yeah, I know him. Yeah. And uh, I only wanted to share this one thing because I've seen doctors give bad news. Yes. And when they say, look, I'm sorry he hasn't got long. And they do their very best to share what will be the inevitable or somebody has just gone, they've lost it. And I admire it. I admire it. It's a very difficult job. And it's a very difficult job. It is, indeed. And I would never be one to advise on how to say something of such sensitivity but William Crawford he came on the day Wilhelmina died about two hours before she died I think I'd probably lost my head I wasn't crying but I just didn't know what to expect I was expecting her to die and he said Come outside for a breath of fresh air. So he went outside. He knew that Wilhelmina got a couple of hours left before she died. He knew that he could see what was happening with the breath and everything. He didn't give me any medical explanation. I mean, it was on the cards. Well, we know what was going to happen. But he said these words. You know, Charles, you know we only come to this earth to love, don't you? Mm. And then I said these words to him. So if she has loved, she has won. Yeah. That to me was closure. Yes. He'd given me an opportunity to think that in spite of the physical death, that she'd won a spiritual death. Yes. A spiritual life. She'd won life. And I thought that was one of the best things I'd ever heard in my life. Mm. We only come to this earth to love. to love. And in that, in that alone, was meaning, was yeah. reason, was everything that mattered. 
And if I could give that to any doctor who would listen to this, that if, if, if those words or words like that could be said, you know, he loved you, didn't he? Mm. He won. Yeah. I mean, that is, for me, a very powerful example of a positive belief about a core element in life. Mm. I mean, we all die. Yes. And if we see in the dying process the super GAU, yeah, the worst case scenario that could happen, mm. then we all lose a terrible loss at the end. And that is really I when when I first was diagnosed, I read a lot of books about near death experiences and <laughs> helped me a lot. Yeah. To see that most people have gone through that process, that means for, in my book, they were the experts, yeah? They came as close as you can and came back to yeah. tell the story. Most of them lost completely the fear of dying. I found that extraordinary. And for me, spiritually, it was an important step to learn that too, to see all of those millions of people on this planet, the millions who experience these near-death experiences, they are from all walks of life, from all religions, from all beliefs. It doesn't matter if you're a Muslim or a Christian or if you're an atheist, they all have the same experiences. For me, that was such a beautiful learning curve to realize... <clears throat> It's not, not just one God for one particular part of the population that happens to have the right party book. Yeah? That is an, a, a universal experience that all co links us together. We are humans. And, okay, what we believe, in which way will we believe? Whatever you find most useful. Yes, and that to see for me it was it was great to just read because I yeah I changed from being religious to spiritual. being spiritual yeah. and to then anyway those books helped me a lot mm. but I want to say something else obviously once somebody is clearly in the dying stage it needs a very skill to very um, skilled to well I mean can I interrupt you once again so there was a chap um, I won't make reference to what he looked like or sounded like or anything because I could and everybody would identify this chap. Don't need it. So I'm don't, I won't do it. But I, I had for a while a little bit of a... anger, I guess. I couldn't... F uh, not so much forgiveness because I immediately forgive people, really. Mm. Generally. Generally, I do. Yes. Generally, I do. I Generally, I can let things go. But this was quite hard. Wilhelmina was sitting in the chair, in the wheelchair, in the hospital. And, uh, I, and this was on the 26th of August, 2016. And it was the second time that she'd um, not been able to breathe very well. Or whatever. And I said, so what, what would be the next step in healing Wilhelmina? What, what's my next thing? What do I need to do? And he says, uh, just right in front of us, palliative care until, termina until termination. And I had to unpack that. Mm. And I'm looking at Wilhelmina, and Wilhelmina's got the, the look of disgust on her face. And I went, palliative care until termination? Did you know you're speaking in front of my wife? And he went, uh, uh, um, uh, we can't do anything for her. What do you mean you can't do anything for her? Anyway, we were so disgusted. That is, yeah, that is for me a very important point. Mm. Because when those guys told me initially, to my question, is there anything I can do to make it better? I got a clear no. 
I realized only a few years later it was the wrong question. I should have asked, is there anything you guys can do to make it better? Mm. Anyway, that clear negativity um, and then seeing lots of doctors in Germany and here and and in, in uh, the United States and in Australia. I have seen in my life so many doctors and that inspires me to write a book about it. Right. Because once you have, I talked with some doctors about it and said, look, I have a really good relation with you as a doctor. So I think I can share that with you. The thing that I'm missing is a skill to communicate negative news well. Yeah. What I would like from my perspective after years with dealing with lots of you guys, and I have not once seen it happening the way I would wish for, and the way I would wish for it goes like this. The facts have to be on the table. I agree with that. So if you have a view about a negative outcome, I don't mind if you put it on the cat table. If you say, sorry, I have bad news, and sorry, your life expectancy in the average is 10 years. I have nothing against you saying that, but, and here comes the big but, you should not stop there. You should then say, that's the average. That doesn't say anything to the individual. And then you should leave the door to hope a little bit open. Mm. You should then mention sometimes things go worse. Some people have less than 10 years, but sometimes it goes much better. Mm. And we don't completely understand why with some people it goes better than with others. I was, but we do believe right. it has something to do with what those people, what patients, what exceptional patients think and feel. And then I would like the last sentence to be that one. Let's try that we as a team, you as the patient and me as the doctor, that we are a team where that happens. Mm. A person who le hears that after having heard the bad news goes out the door the, different, the, goes out of the door differently. Yeah. Well, that's very true. And, and look, you know, I loved what William, William Crawford yes. said to me. Um, he was speaking to my father-in-law. Uh, funny enough, my father-in-law passed away last year. But he was speaking to him after Wilhelmina had, um, had passed away. And he said, you know, when she was diagnosed, because of the intensity of this cancer, there was almost nothing that we could do. And then I questioned William and I said, William, then why treat her at all? Mm. If that was the case, if on the 23rd of December 2014, there was nothing you could do in spite of all that you could do. And then he said, he named the Steiner's philosophy. Mm -hmm. And he says, we always treat to cure. Even if there is no hope, we always treat to cure. We we act as if there is hope. Yes. So. Yes, it so, makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. So even though I have, so for instance, I have singers. Singers who are not musical. Yeah. They've never been exposed to music. In any way, they merely have decided that at this late point in their life, they're going to try it. Yes, good on them. Good. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> right. Now, somebody who's musical, somebody who's been exposed to music and knows musical language, they improve very quickly. Yeah. Because you can give them concepts of flow, resonance, ideas behind feeling, expression, and it's built into their mechanism. Yeah. But somebody who hasn't had that, it's another language. Yeah. But even, it's, it's not 18 months, it's three to six years, because you've got to teach through feeling, timing, intonation, yeah. key, and these are all skills that you don't manifest automatically. No. So, so 
sometimes my knowledge says this person is going to be a long-term patient. Yeah, yeah. And with the possibility, if I took the the, uh, the critical view that there is no quote-unquote cure. Yeah, yeah. But I can't disallow the hope. Exactly. Because in the process of healing the voice, you heal posture, you heal breath. You heal the manifestation of divinity. Mm-hmm. Very few people think they're divine. Yeah. Especially those who haven't linked themselves to the spiritual. Everything is th- mechanistic. Yes. And yet what I feel is that when you start to manifest divine expression, i.e. when you express, you connect with other people. mm mm-hmm. That's a link. That's a divine link. It's a spiritual link. It's an emotional link. You're creating something. Most people don't look at themselves as divine or another or other dimensions. Then they're, they're a mechanism. They're an organism, and that's it. Mm. So when when I'm thinking about you know treating to cure, well, if you don't treat to cure, you're robbing people of hope. Yes, um, the, the help is, and that is something I have to talk to quite a few doctors, um, doctors who wouldn't talk the way I want them to. Mm. And, I, and some of them I said, I know you guys are afraid of giving false hope. Mm. And in my book, hope is never false. Mm. It may be in your um, medical um, view unrealistic, But there are always patients who achieve things that are unrealistic. I mean, I'm now one of them. Right. You told me 10 years. That was 25 years ago. <laughs> so if I would have believed you guys, I would have robbed my body of the helpful, hopeful environment it needs. Hope is a, is a, is a force in its own And and look and I don't and I think I want to be really I think it was um, Jim Carrey who said something and I I can't remember the quote but uh, but I've kind of articulated it differently that hope is not wishful thinking hope is the manifestation of the action you take yes it's a belief and belief is not a fact no but, but you choose and and actually mm. it was really interesting Ian Gawler said denial is the second best approach dealing with an illness. <laughs> I had a lot of it. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Denial is far better than accepting the facts and feel shitty about it. Denial is actually part of the mechanism within grief. It's yeah, part of a process. Can, yeah, yeah, part a of period. A, yeah. yeah, it's a period of time. And, and, I, and I think it's really important that, you know, denial is part of the um, writings of uh, of the of the cancer society i think it's important not to get stuck in that denial no but it is but we're not we're not talking about choice here we're talking we're, we're, well i'm not what well, i'm I talking think, about is this i think you could choose to stay in the denial if oh, you oh, want I, to okay yes you can but that would be a manifestation of victimhood not necessarily according to ian gola it's highly successful Okay, two type, two types of denial. The other denial, the one I'm referring to, is the one associated with grief, where you have no, you have no idea what is happening. Yeah, that you you say this can't possibly be happening to me. Yeah. So there's a rejection of reality. Yeah. The other side of the denial, I think you're referring to, is, well, actually, I haven't got it. Right. <laughs> it's it's more like a it's more like the stoicism. Yes, it's I mean it's we all know there is the placebo effect. Yes, we do. Yeah. So we know how powerful the mind is. Mm. And that is from that was really disappointing for me after 20 years of experience with the with cancer and doctors and then my experiences in the states and in um, australia with people who use their mind and then to come back in 2016 roughly after 20 years or something 
to Germany had had to have treatment there again. And it was comical. I was I was in that room where everybody gets treated for the day. So everybody gets hooked on to heavy chemical stuff. Yep. And <laughs> it's a very special atmosphere. I mean, there are some super sick people there, and you know some will not survive. Right, yeah. And um, there are some people who are hopeful, like me, and there are some people who don't know, and there are some people with their partners and people without their partners. So it's a huge mix of different life circumstances. And you spend a truckload of time there, hooked onto that yeah. thing that can take five hours. Not moving. And the only thing, the only literature you find is magazines. And then I approached a wonderful doctor in that facility. I had a fantastic connection with him. I said, look, I think this is a missed opportunity. I'm deeply convinced I wouldn't be alive anymore if I wouldn't have discovered a book that led me to take part in a course in the United States. And I think, by all means, keep your magazines, but you could have a small bookshelf that long with life-encouraging content. Mm. And then not everybody will read it. They don't have to. But maybe one like me. Or maybe every month somebody will read it, get inspired, and does something about his health. How about that? Mm. And then he got fired up and said, yes, he will ask his colleagues. The next day he was there and said, how was the talk with your colleagues? They don't want it. I said, can you explain why? It's too risky. To give people hope. Exactly. Yeah. And then I said, look, yesterday I had a little magazine that explained how to train a dog. None of you guys are afraid I train a dog, get bitten and said, you guys had the, the, the pamphlet lying here. It's your fault. I got bitten. You had it there. But if there is a book that teaches you to think better, that's dangerous. I can't do that. No. Mm. That's bizarre. Mm. So he was as disappointed as I was. But I just thought the, the thought that putting books out that includes hope is dangerous. 